We're going to open this up then for uh, questions and answers, but before we do that, I just want to just uh, uh, briefly recap a couple of uh, salient points I think the, the uh, panel provided for us. I want to start with Norm. Uh, I, I've known Norm for quite a number of years when I was uh, working with Navajo Nation, uh, building up the Navajo Nation's TANF program. But more importantly, I've got to know him on a level of what, at the time, he was providing uh, through the uh, uh, CETA program, the JTPA program, and those programs as such. Uh, true story, Norm. Navajo, you know us Navajos very, very well. Uh, this, this is a true story coming from the Chinle Agency. When CETA was first introduced to Navajo, uh, a gentleman was uh, hired on to be a CETA participant in working. So every morning he'd tell his wife, um, I'm going to work uh, at CETA Project. And of course, she didn't really understand what CETA Project was all about. So one day he didn't come home one evening. It was on a Friday at payday. And apparently his truck broke down somewhere outside in the outskirts of Chin Lee. And so he didn't get home like until about almost midnight, and his wife was waiting up for him. And uh, he noticed that there was a bag sitting outside of the house. And so he's wondering, what the heck is that bag doing outside of the house? So he went up to the door and knocking on his door, and uh, she wouldn't answer for a while. And the next thing you know, she kept knocking on the door, and he still would, she still wouldn't answer. So finally, after about a minute or two, she goes, why don't you just go stay with Sita and let her cook for you? <laughs> True story, Norm. So Norm gave us a, a good perspective of Sita uh, and also really some salient recommendations that he made in regards to um, the nuances of uh, workforce uh, training and development. And I think you'll, you'll see a lot of that embedded in the uh, study that was done by NCAI, so I won't really divulge too much details in that, but I believe he really touched on some very key points in his discussion. Marianne, I provided really the perspective of tribal TANF, and that's really important because uh, in today's world, in regards to employment, and in regards to training and education, it's all a part of the goals and objectives of why TANF was developed in the first place as a welfare to work program but more importantly, really to achieve the successes of employing our Native families and individuals. So she really uh, touched on some really key points in that. Gloria, um, I really uh, loved her presentation. Uh, she really gave us a perspective, broadened out the uh, vantage point of really what they're doing and thinking out of the box in Alaska and just the innovation of the types of programs and services uh, that they've been able to, to develop and achieve, and I really uh, enjoyed that presentation. And then, of course, with uh, Margaret, a really strong uh, presentation on PL-102-477, using that as a model to develop a uh, program and uh, in, in involving all the different types of services that she's provided here. So I think from each uh, presenter, they've, they've really given us a very unique uh, perspective of um, workforce development. They gave us uh, an important uh, uh, process in which each tribe and each organization has done to really then become innovative enough to provide services for their families uh, in their respective areas. So I really I want to again thank the panel for that and, uh, and provide that information for us. So with that, um, I'd like to go ahead and open up to you, um, audience uh, participants. Um, if you have any questions that you have of the panel, uh, I think we have a microphone. Ian's got a microphone there. So uh, if you have a, a, a burning question that you want, want to ask any one of the panel members, uh, please do so. And in doing so, uh, just uh, state your name real quick, uh, who you represent, and what your uh, official capacity is with your organization or the tribe. So. I'll go ahead and open up the uh, discussion for questions and answers at this time. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Carol Evans, and I'm the uh, chairwoman from chairwoman from the Spokane Tribe of Indians. So great, great discussion, great um, presentation. 
Um, my question, um, kind of, you, you kind of answered it, I think, but a lot of what you talked about was taking this outside and inside money and really creating success with the people, training the people, economic development. But, but when, you, when you look at it from a leader's perspective, how do you um, go about breaking down those barriers, those silos with all of that federal funding we take in from all of the areas, um, whether it's BIA money and then you have your 477 program over here and these people are providing the mental health service or the alcohol and drug treatment and over here you're trying to help families. How do you break those barriers or like the tarot, you talked about tarot and then 477. How do you get those programs to start breaking down, I can't do that. No, I can't do that, go over there and all of a sudden this one stop shop, I know that was a 477 thing back a while. How, what, what are some of your um, ideas on breaking down those silos and barriers within, within the tribe itself and all the people that they have working? Okay, excellent question. You wanna take that one, Norm? Uh, pardon me, but I'm very eager to answer that question. <clears throat> because it is the conundrum of 477. And I've seen this, and, and uh, those in the program have seen this. It is not easy. To me, the key is leadership. And that leadership appropriately starts at the council level. By having the council realize that it's the future of the tribe that's at stake in terms of the effectiveness of the services. It's not just the money that flows through, or I'll get lynched for saying this, the amount you get out of indirect. But it's the effectiveness of the services that requires imagination. I recall at Cook Inlet when things started, uh, and at a number of other tribes, it was imagination and people, including people who were very familiar with job training programs, who saw this as an opportunity. And they were able to get council support for, for it. But the role of tribal leaders in making programs more effective in whatever way, it's not just 477, 477 has its limitations too, and Gloria and Margaret have been doing a fantastic job in trying to break through some of those limitations. But it's a matter of being able to look at it from a tribal perspective and at the leadership level. You're elected in order to be able to improve the community. Yes, individual members, certainly. We have plenty of success stories no matter how you run workforce programs. But it's the community perspective, what the programs do, and then I'll stop, because I could talk about this for a while. <laughs> what the programs do to me, and I'm an outsider, right? I'm an outsider, rank outsider. What the programs do should be measured and what they do for people that don't participate, that never heard of the program because of what the program has done to change things. I'll go back to my Zuni example. Nobody in the room, I think, knows anything about it, so I can talk about it freely. Go back to my Zuni example, that people who are able to take college courses on the Pueblo and not have to travel 70 miles into Gallup to go to those courses were the ones who benefited. That came out of what was once upon a time the CETA program. Go back to Alex's joke. Alex is one of the funniest people I know. He has another one that's really terrific, but you got to know all the people involved. <laughs> so that, I lost my train of thought. So that it's really at the leadership level that you've got to break through. One of the interesting things to me in looking at tribal leaders is the, the mix, the mix in a variety of tribes of younger people that have new ideas and experience and the cultural heritage that is maintained by the culture barriers in the tribe that are part of the leadership, the key leadership, core leadership, whether they're elected or not.
but it has to come from the leadership. It is not easy. Sometimes it doesn't work because you have some strong personalities. As program directors, it just aren't going to get along. So you wait, and eventually there's a change, and then you can do it. But it's leadership, it's innovation, imagination at the staff level, and most important of all, it's got to have the support of the leadership. Okay, I get to jump up next. Like Norn said, leadership, don't micromanage. I give that example because we asked a tribe for a copy of their Johnson O'Malley application. We were trying to help a student that was moving into their area. And they told us they couldn't give it to us yet until the tribal council met and approved the application form. I said, what? The tribal council is wasting their time on an application? They have better things to do to manage the legal issues, to manage the growth of the tribe. Why are they messing with an application? Train your people, give them room to succeed. You'll find them pulling you along with it. Um, Spokane, I recall, if I remember correctly, Spokane to Tribal TANF in 477. They did economic development, microenterprises, and TANF was screaming in DC, can't do that, you can't do that. And now what do I hear but Tribal TANF. Oh, you can go do economic development with Tribal TANF. It's like, you beat the heck out of Spokane over that <coughs> because they did just that. And now you're telling everybody, you should do that. Like, what? Leadership. And then give them reign to succeed. Yes, you follow the laws. Yes, you meet the audit requirements. Yes you find and ask for waivers where it needs to be asked for. Get those dot your I's, cross your T's, but get that in writing. If you can't co-locate them legally in the same budget, same plan of service, 477s, co-locate them and look and see other ways. For example, Department of Justice, CTAS, Consolidated Tribal Assistance Solicitation, Purpose Area Number 3, talks about being able to do re-entry programs. Well, push that button a little bit. Citizen Potawatomi pushed it and said, we're going to do one. We're going to model it after our 477. We wrote the plan to be a mo exact copy of what we were doing 477. We got approved. And every time we go to training and every time we do a report, they want us to talk about how many people were in the court. We're not associated with court. We're associated with employment training. We tell them what we did, is our, what our goals were, and we answer it. Nowhere does it tell you what the application has to look like. So guess what their application looks like? It's the 477 application. So we consider them duly enrolled. First three years was reentry only. Now, I don't know what we did right, but we didn't have anybody recidivize back into, we had one out of 50. Next three years we went after it, we've gone for, um, the right word. Diversionary. People on the path to go to prison if they don't change what the behaviors they have now. So we're doing diversionary activities. Again, I think we've had two recidivize, counting the first one plus one more. We're doing well. Don't really know why that is, but we are. And I credit our staff with being very good. So if you can't collate the, pro the program or the plan, look if you can do something else. LIHEAP. I may not have LIHEAP in 477, but guess what? They also don't tell you what the application has to look like. You do have to ask, answer certain questions. So our latest maneuver, we've been doing LIHEAP in, our, in the same department. Our latest maneuver is changing the LIHEAP application to look just like the 477 application. And when conceivable, they'll be duly enrolled. Not all of them will be, but majority of them will be. So leadership, and then give your people some room. Treat them and let them know what's going on, but treat them as, have them be amba um, ambassadors to the community, because they're the ones that's going to grow you. Great question. Um, this is something in my leadership role that we've had a lot of conversation around. Um, so what I would say, as, as you uh, heard in the presentation, the CITC is very innovative. Uh, and we look at how we create programming and resources out of the box, right? 
to respond to community need. And we're always searching for that. But what we find is that within the, um, within the levels of leadership in the organization, if uh, the entire senior management doesn't understand the tool of 477 and how effectively we can leverage it, it's going to be very difficult for them to work with all of the program directors. And, um, you know, and really understanding the points that we could push back on, uh, really looking at where, where we could be more creative. And because we've struggled with this, over uh, the last couple of de decades now, what we did is we intentionally set up um, an initiative and it was called, um, is basically a tribal organization without walls. We were trying to break down all the silos and the barriers and have, have our staff look at our participants as whole, regardless of where they come into the organization and where they, they leave, right? And, and so that push people in their thought process of looking at not as this is my program, because you know, the feds do that really well and they teach us how to do that really well, right? But really looking at the individual and saying what does the individual need and then coming at it from that perspective. Um, it's a struggle, I'll tell you. We continue to fight this on a daily basis uh, but we had to change the way in which we operated. So that behavior of how we work together changed. And of course, our board is always, you know, stay within the guidelines of the law, but push the line. So they've given us free reign to do this as well. As Norm said, the leadership, it needs to stop, uh, start at the top with leadership. Uh, we also went to a single intake uh, across CITC, so across 50 programs. And um, it took us a decade to get there, if you can believe that. Uh, just because of, well, mm, I'm not sure if uh, through SAMHSA I can require this information. So it was, it's just been a struggle, and it's a daily struggle, and will continue to be one. Uh, but I think, we, I think that we're, better, much better than we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, but I, I do believe that senior leadership really needs to understand the tools that we have in our organization and figure out how we can effectively leverage those tools and then help other leadership grow. That's a great question. And for North Fork Rancheria, we have very limited funds. So we had to find a way to, to work with our programs together. And I have one example of how we thought outside the box and became very creative. We write into our ICDBG grants that we must have three TANF clients that work along with whatever the ICDBG grant is. Uh, the one that we did was for a volunteer fire station. We partnered with our local county, put up our ICDBG grants, dollars, 600,000, to help build the fire station, but also mandated that our TANF clients would work to help build that fire station. And we do that with every one of our ICBG grants now. We started that in 2007, and we automatically write that in. But at the same time, we used our construction company through our Indian Housing Authority to provide job training for those ICDBG grant uh, TANF recipients. So we were able to merge our, our housing, our TANF, and our ICDBG all together and work with the county. By doing that, we actually end up with 15 acres in North Fork because we were a landless tribe. It's in fee land, but we traded that 600,000 to help build that fire station for 15 acres. And then we turned around and built our TANF administration office, our tribal uh, transit office, administration office, and now we're building our Indian Housing Authority administration office and using our TAN of clients to help build those and work in different capacities, whether it's administration or labor. That, that's how we have to think. I mean, we have limited funds. We're not a gaming tribe, and so we just have to figure out how to work this together and blend all departments and make sure that TAN of and our TAN of clients get job, job uh, skills out of it. 
Any other uh, questions uh, from the audience? Thank you. Hey, Dorian, how are you? Good, how are you? Far away from home to see you. <laughs> no. um, the question is directed mainly to you about your reference to a barrier crime. When I was working for TCC as the uh, president, uh, early on it was identified there's always a problem with trying to provide 477 type uh, services to participants because of some, uh, the fact that some of them did have uh, criminal records. And it was a, um, it had very astounding effect in terms of uh, uh, not permitting people with, uh, you know, that uh, criminal background to seek work, qualify for training, and, you know, and to not be able to work in certain functions of the nonprofit, like, um, you know, in, in educational related activities or in uh, respite care provision, child care, this stuff. So my question is how did you, I mean, how, how did you, I, uh, you know, the, how did you plan out your action plan who did you talk to, and you know what did you do to 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 make it possible for people with barrier crime background to participate? So this was completely inspired by our participant voice. Um, we we started to engage uh, as as we thought about how to uh, move the needle in our schools and really equipped our, our parents with uh, the right skill and information that they need to help their young people, <coughs> students, uh, move through um, systems that could be pretty crushing and bureaucratic. Um, we learned a lot through that process. And so um, what we did is we've created uh, various groups where parents, where participants tell us what they need and what will change their life. And we went directly to the people we serve and we asked them the questions. And it was through that process that we realized that we were missing a lot of incredible um, staff opportunities because um, you know, as you start checking the boxes, we were just checking the boxes and we weren't pushing back. And I have to give Lisa Rieger here a lot of credit, our legal counsel, because we started pushing back. And we said, no, we're gonna take this the whole way. It may take, it takes months to get waivers. But when we see somebody who is right for our mission and who will work alongside of our participants and we're thoughtful about it, of course you gotta get all the information, and it's the right placement, we will work to uh, get a waiver. And uh, we started being successful with it. it. Takes a lot more time and energy, but I think that it's really important um, that we, we uh, provide this opportunity to folks who wouldn't normally um, be able to you know, work for an organization like CITC. So we could share with you some of the process that we've implemented around it. It's a case-by-case -case basis. <laughs> Good question. Just uh, by a show of hands, how many tribal representatives or uh, tribal leaders that are here that have a 477 program now? Just, I raise a hand. Okay, so we got a few members here. Good. Any other questions for the panelists here? How are we doing on time, Ian? We're good on time. We're good? <laughs> okay, follow up. So, um, I, one of you talked about how you hired a teacher to work alongside another teacher. Can you talk a little bit more about that? That sounds really interesting, but it's also, you know, it sounds like 
the teacher isn't doing, I, I initially thought, well, that teacher's not doing their job if they're not able to teach the children, but if we're bringing someone in, are they acting as a tutor or what? It, how does that work? Oh, I apologize if I um, wasn't clear. Um, but to clarify, Cook Inlet Tribal Council, uh, to make an impact in the Anchorage School District uh, in connecting our young people to their potential and mainly, uh, you know, to ensure that they have the opportunity to graduate, what we decided to do several years ago was to hire teachers, certified teachers that are CITC employees we place them in the Anchorage School District schools. So they're working in the high schools, the middle schools, the elementary schools. And uh, they work right alongside of all of the other teachers. They have their own classrooms, right? And they teach our students uh, advanced math, advanced science, uh, English. We uh, have uh, moved into a uh, fairly robust partnership with the university where now we're bringing um, elementary college courses into the classroom uh, using distance uh, delivery techniques. So they're highly certified teachers. They teach the classes, but they are not school district employees. So it's very creative. It is, it is a public school, yes. I have a question there. <laughs> I know that was weird, but so your teacher is working with the public school teacher teaching the kids, but because you have the public school teacher there, that's how they're getting their education and getting their certificate. No, we so teach the kids. They are highly certified teachers. They just have their own classrooms inside of the high schools. But we did this through developing an agreement with the Anchorage School District. And the reason why, it's been a long journey, the reason why they allow us to do it is because they need the teachers and they need the space. And as you can see, our kids um, are doing very well with the 91% graduation rate. Okay, any other questions from the audience? Another question. Okay. She's, she's allowed as many as she wants. I, I made her do a panel yesterday, so. <laughs> so um, I think it was you who talked about WEX. And um, so does that program help single people, or does it have to focus on the family? Because I know in our case, you're not eligible because you don't have kids. So we have students. You, you can't. You can't be in our program because you don't have a kid. It's like telling these young people go out and have kids so you can get service from, you know, and that, and, that's and, and not a, good. And unfortunately, that's, that is the problem. Yeah, it, it doesn't help the single. You can through uh, preventions three and four, you can, you can help uh, single individuals um, for a job training, any kind of programs that are happening within the town of program, you, you, they can come in under prevention and take part in those programs. But yes, TANF is for family, for cash aid, for social services. And, and, and Ryan back here is yeah. going to answer it better. So. Just, just a comment on that is that um, I, I'm with the Owen Valley Career Development Center. And, uh, you know, for those of you that uh, operate TANF every three years, you have to do a plan. And so um, our last plan renewal, um, we wrote that into the plan that we could serve um, individuals between the ages of 18 and 24 um, because that really is the, um, we, we just really see a, a strong need there for services for those young adults who, you know, don't have children themselves and, you know, aren't um, fully prepared. Um, so you can do stuff like that, um, you know, as long as you get the approval of the agency through TANF. I, I would add one thing. Quit getting hung up on the terminology. Work experience, DWEX, mm -hmm. work experience, TANF. Mm -hmm. TANF may focus on temporary assistance for needy families. GA allows you to do single individuals. Right. So use GA. Use your workforce. You can still do it under all of these. Use your CSBG, Community Services Block Grant. 
Don't get hung up on where you can't do it. Start looking where you can do it. Uh, well, let me try something just very quickly, a pet idea of mine. A lot of these programs, TANF is one of them. The uh, workforce programs funded by the Labor Department are an excellent example. They are second chance programs. I'm old enough to remember when they wrote books about uh, CETA is a second chance program. What I think we need in the Coeur d'Alene, I really am, appreciate what Ian did with the Coeur d'Alene case study. What we really need, in addition to the second chance programs, they have a very important function to perform, is a first chance program before people get into trouble. And that, I think, is very key. I have railed for years against the Labor Department by calling their main program an adult program. It's not. We deliberately kept an age requirement out of the program. So for instance, take your kid to work. You got to have working parents take them at least to a work site so that they can get used to it. I mean, that was a very telling experience in my own life. When I went to my father's factory, saw how they made paper products. It stuck with me all these years. I don't want to say how many decades. <laughs> but it's the first chance thing. I think part of the innovation that is really needed is to look more in that direction. I mean, in healthcare, preventive care is now kind of beginning to come into its own, and not just remediation once people get really sick. But we need a first chance program focusing on how to build from the beginning. From the beginning, I, well, there are other examples I don't want to go on too long, but we need to be able to start dealing with people before they have problems and not only help them after they have problems. Okay. We have a question up here in front. Well, I was just going to add that one of the advantages of 477 is that you can do TANF prevention with it because when you're consolidating the funds and you're streamlining services, you have more funding for direct services. And so on, and on our third floor, which is our combined TANF and employment and training program, if people come in and sign up, whether it's for GA or TANF or whatever, they're going to go over to our career ready program at the same time. And sometimes they get a job before they get qualified. Um, or determine their eligibility. And so that's another way in which 477 is a, in a really important tool and helps get at that first chance opportunity. Okay, good. Any other uh, questions from the audience or comments? All right, and um, well, let's uh, proceed on then uh, with the next process here in which uh, Again, I want to thank all the participants for their questions. Um, this portion of the uh, program is just uh, some questions that I would raise with the, uh, the panelists in, uh, uh, based on the uh, presentations that were provided. So I do have a, a couple of questions, so let me uh, frame it, uh, the first question. And, and, uh, so panelists, first of all, you, you did an excellent job providing some really uh, core and basic information about tribal workforce development. Uh, I want to ramble off a couple of statistics here, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Glenn Basconcillo, uh, who's working with us at the Tribal TANF Task Force for uh, developing a white paper that we're presenting to the NCAI in regards to tribal TANF. And I think there is some relevance in regards to that information. First of all, of course, Tribal TANF in and of itself, uh, there's 73 tribes. Uh, there are, are approved tribal TANF. Uh, it's, it's funding about 194 million and, uh, for all the 73 tribes. But in that, um, what we're addressing as well, and I think that the, the relevancy here is that uh, in, in 2010, 28% uh, of the Native American population lives in poverty and almost twice the, the it's almost twice the national poverty rate of 15.3 percent so when we talk in the context of workforce development when we talk in the context of what was presented i think the relevance is there that these are high statistic rates that exist within indian country uh, uh, for uh, native americans the other uh, 
uh, percentage I wanted to raise was that Native American joblessness is approximately 49% as measured by the BIA labor force report and unemployment rate uh, across uh, Indian country is, is, uh, uh, is higher than the national average of uh, the national un unemployment rate. And, and of course, when we look at these type of statistics and uh, having coming from reservation homelands, um, of course, the, the unemployment rates are high in, in how we then address it through these programs, whether it's the WIOA program or the uh, Tribal TANA program. But the whole sense of it is really being to able to achieve uh, the successes of then those end goals of training, of education, of employment. Um, Norm started out with the thought of strategic thinking in regard to that and those programs that have been involved in this uh, uh, development of, of jobs and, and workforce uh, creation and workforce development. Uh, any one of you, if, if you could answer just maybe in general, looking at those statistics as a baseline and looking at your uh, tribal statistics, uh, how important is it that not only are we wanting to decrease the statistics as presented, but more importantly, looking at the tribal uh, environment and, and job creation and job opportunities, how important is it then when we start thinking out of the box in that context? So, to the panel. You can't ignore those and improve numbers. I'll, I'll use said decrease, I'll just say improvement. Mm -hmm. um, whether you're working and keeping them in school, you know, when we're facing at our program and seeing six people who are in, not even out of grade school dropping out, where did they go? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you've got to work at it at every level. And that may mean keeping the utilities on for someone through a supportive service program CSBG, LIHEAP, whatever that word is. But you can't ignore those numbers, but you also can't go and, and just say, I'm gonna change one piece. You really need to look at a full spectrum. Uh, it's not really for me to do this, but, and I don't know that anybody else has used the word, culture. If you're going to build a community, that community has to have culture which has roots. The one thing that native communities in this hemisphere have in spades is cultural roots. And that has to be seen as the key to so much. It's not a matter of making native people look white. That's not where the solution is going to come from. Yes, we use the tools that the majority community uses in terms of workforce tools, assessment, uh, testing, uh, counseling, the whole nine yards. But the culture has to be there, and it has to be there for future generations. I hear the, the numbers that Alex threw out. I mean, I deal with those numbers almost every day now that I've been reduced to being a census guru. But uh, that's not really the story. The story, and the story which Native people can tell better than anybody else, is the holistic nature. Several of the panelists talked about this when they talked about their services. You deal with people as people. You deal with people as culture. Deal with people who have ancestors who are here before anybody else. And it's instilling that. And that becomes very hard, particularly for youth. That's why, even though I know nothing about services to youth, that's why I know it's the most important thing you can do. Because to perpetuate tribes, you've got to perpetuate the culture. And I am very excited when I go to tribal festivals and see participating in traditional singing in the native language. Kids who are 5, 10, 15 years old 
It's among the most uplifting sights I've seen in, in years. So that it's, and everybody knows that, it's the core of all the programs, it's been at the core of tribal workforce programs since they were invented. But being able to keep that uppermost in your mind and work toward that, I think, is a lot. It's not just a matter of making the numbers look better. It's being able to draw on the strengths of people and the strengths of who they are, where they came from, who their forebearers were that are going to make this work. Complex. Um, yeah, I'll go there. Um, <laughs> when I think about, uh, for example, Cook Inlet Tribal Council being in an urban area, we have a lot more opportunities uh, to connect people to various industries across the, our great state of Alaska. And we also know as an organization that we don't work in isolation, that we have a value of intradependence where we work with other organizations regardless of um, you know, being in the native community or outside of the native community. So, so we're really employing a tactic and a strategy called collective impact where we align several different organizations, their might and their resources to create impact for our families um, and as we do that we are able to you know create a lot more resource and opportunity in different ways to meet people where they are um, and I'd also say as an Alaska Native person being um, I spent my entire life in this the state I often think about our rural areas and the fact of the matter is is they're just that we don't have a lot of jobs in rural Alaska. We don't have the economic base. Um, and so I think this is again where we have strong communities, we have strong cu culture, but we're trying to, we're trying to put ourselves into what success looks like at a Western perspective. We don't need to do that. And so I think it's really about again, innovation, tribal participation, defining what success looks like. What does that look like for communities? And then aligning resources to support those individuals. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's where you really think out of the box. And, you know, we've also had to deal with um, the, the other end of the spectrum where, you know, we got entitlement issues we have to deal with. There's a lot of opportunity for our people. And so uh, we're trying to create, especially for our young people, to let them know what they have standing in front of them as an opportunity to really engage. And how do you, how do you uh, ensure, how do you do that in a respectful way that's lined with values? So I think it's a very complex question. And I think, you know, the, 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 the that, that it takes, as Norm said, it takes us as a community, and it takes all the generations in our community to respond to it, because it's, it's about a holistic approach rather than, you know, a job. Okay. It's something much more. Thank you. That was a tough question. So for North Fork Rancheria, um, we're in a difficult situation. We're in the center of California in Madera County, and in California have one of the highest unemployment rates at around 15%. So your question is, how do we plan on decreasing, or like said, improve mm -hmm. those numbers? North Fork, the town of North Fork was hit hard in the 80s when the mill closed down. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of jobs were for our native people and for the local community. Mm -hmm. Jobs left North Fork. What happens when you don't have a job in, in town? Your people leave because they have to go look for work. So the bottom line of how do you improve that is you have to create jobs. Job creation is it. How is North Fork Rancheria going to do that? And I don't want to use the dirty word if somebody wants to think it's a dirty word, but by, we're going to do it by a casino project. We are the fifth largest tribe in California. 
We have over 2,000 tribal citizens with the majority of them living in the Fresno and Bedera County. So for us, our casino project is about job creation for our tribal citizens and for the local community. It'll be around 800 to 1,500 jobs. And that's, I mean, bottom line, that's the only way to improve this. Mm -hmm. It's the only way to help our people. Right. Thank you. And then I just have one, just one final question, real easy one. Um, do you feel that right now, as we stand, the federal government is doing enough to fund, to fund the workforce innovation that we're talking about here today? Do you feel that we're, they're doing a good job with that? No? no. <laughs> if they funded what the law says, yeah. In fact, that would help. to add a little co color, not only are they not adequately funding programs, but they are wasting their time and energy and effort to fight these programs at the highest levels within various departments. And as a taxpayer, I would be outraged to find out how many dollars are being wasted over just ridiculous issues of, oh, you gotta like put an A over here because that's reporting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not sure how somebody could run the federal government effectively. But I think it's not only the funding issue, it, it's, it's really the engagement issue with tribes and tribal organizations and um, how, how we effectively can work together so that you know, we're not wasting time and money. Thank you. For, for North Fork Rancheria, what we did was we became a self-governance tribe. Becoming a self-governance tribe and getting off of the 638 contract allowed for us to retain some of those funds that BIA was retaining for their administration cost. We all know how that works. So I highly suggest if you're not part of 477 and you're on BIA uh, contract, you should look into self-governance because that's the only way to get some of the extra funds coming back in and then look at as other programs that are available. Um, it's the only way to do it, it's, but we're never gonna get enough. Well, again, I just want to thank you. It's been, a, again, a privilege and an honor to uh, have been asked to moderate this uh, presentation. And I want to thank you, each and every one of here, uh, Norm, uh, Margaret, uh, Gloria, and Marianne. Let's give them a round of applause real quick.